Is projector screen paint any different than normal paint? Let's find out. In this video, I've got eight different screen paints from Home Depot, popular YouTube projector screen paint channels, as well as from the well-established brand Paint On Screen, and we're gonna run them through a bunch of tests with six different projectors to see once and for all if projector screen paints are worth 10 times more than the cans you can get off the shelf at your local hardware store. As always, there are no sponsored reviews on this channel, but to further remove any potential bias towards one brand or another, I put my wife in charge of painting the screens, and instead of using their brand names, she labeled the screen paints with the letters A through H as she applied them to my two identical 92-inch PVC screens. And again, I tested all the paints without knowing their brand name, but for your benefit, here are the paints that we'll be looking at in this video. Paint A was the Bayer I300 Dead Flat White, which was $22 a gallon at Home Depot. And my wife said that it went on extremely easily and it had perfect coverage after a single coat on top of primer, but she did do a second coat just for good measure. Paint B was Paint On Screen's 3D 4K formulation, which is over 10 times more expensive at $269 a gallon. The 3D 4K wasn't quite as thick as the Bare i300 paint, but it still had very good coverage and no issues with any streaking or texture. Paint C was another formulation from Paint On Screen called S1 Ultimate Contrast, which was $224 a gallon, and my wife noted that this was the thickest paint yet and covered very easily, but did leave a very slight texture from the roller due to the thickness of the paint. Paint D was the first from the YouTube paint channels, and this is from Crow1176 called his Ultra Black or UB Mix, which was $60 for a quart or $240 for a gallon. Crow's formulation is very clearly homemade and my paint arrived via USPS in a plastic container and unfortunately had been damaged in shipping, leaking roughly 10% of the paint into the bubble wrap and cardboard shipping box. My wife noted that Crow's Ultra Black was the thinnest paint yet and required two coats just to get a full initial coverage and after that she did a third and fourth finish coat. Paint E was another YouTuber paint from Black Series Edition LLC and this is their Imperior Gunmetal Black Widow paint and I paid $289 for a gallon, making it the most expensive expensive paint yet. The Black Series paint also came in four plastic to-go style containers, but survived the shipping process without any issues. The Black Series paint went on with the least texture so far, but required three coats for complete coverage and then a fourth finish coat. And my wife did note that the paint had a bit of an unpleasant musty smell, but that went away quickly after drying. Paint F was an off-the-shelf Home Depot color called PPG Metallic Tones, specifically their Foundry color mix, which is recommended by the YouTuber Robert Briggs. I paid $26 for a quart, but a full gallon is only $60. Unfortunately, this was the first paint that didn't go on very well, and after three coats, the finish was still streaky, and you could easily see the roller lines from where the metallic sparkles were in higher and lower concentrations. We were able to make it slightly better by giving the entire screen a light sanding and watering down the final coat, but the roller lines never fully went away. Paint G was the last YouTuber screen paint from Parte Projection Screens, and this is their Sirius C formulation, which I paid $60 for for a quart, which would come out to $240 a gallon. For some reason, Parte doesn't ship to Florida, so I had to order this to my parents' house in Ohio and have them forward it on to me, but unlike the other YouTuber paints, the Parte paint came in a legitimate paint can and had no issues with leaking. My wife noted that the Parte Series C was the thinnest and most watery of all the paints, but after three coats it had full coverage and she added a fourth coat for good measure. And last, Paint H was another formulation from Paint On Screen called Black Projection Surface, which was not only the darkest, but also the most expensive at $299 a gallon. And like the PPG Metallic Tones, even after four coats, the black projection surface had visible roller marks, and after light sanding and a finish coat with thinned paint, the marks improved but never went away completely. So for ease of application, the Bayer i300, Black Series Imperial Black Widow and Crow's Mix were the easiest to apply evenly with a roller, and the PPG Metallic Tones and the Paint On Screen Black Projection Surface were the most difficult and would definitely benefit from being sprayed rather than rolled. However, the most obvious difference between these paints is their color and their resulting screen gain, which put simply is the amount of light that gets reflected from the screen compared to a white reference screen. To test this, I started by doing a rough calibration on a BenQ X500i projector using my ISF certified 1.1 gain white surface, and afterwards I measured an average average grayscale error of 0.7 and a color error of 1.9. And for reference, we generally say that any color delta error under 2.0 is imperceptible to the human eye. And after calibration, projecting a 92 inch screen, the X500i measured 126.51 nits peak brightness with a 0.0749 nit black floor, giving it a native contrast ratio of 1688 to one. Then without moving the projector or the test probe, I measured each screen's peak brightness, 
black floor, grayscale curve, and color accuracy. And here are the resulting gain values calculated against my 1.1 gain reference screen, where you can see that the Bear i300 and Paint on Screen 3D 4K both had higher peak brightness than my reference screen. The S1 Ultra Contrast and Crow Screen Paint had middle of the road screen gains of around 0.69 and 0.56. And the rest of the paints measured extremely low gains, reflecting less than 15% of the projected light back at the viewer, with the Parte Series E coming in the darkest under 0.09 gain. All the paints except for the 3D 4K resulted in a higher grayscale or color error, but the paint on screen S1 Ultra Contrast and Crow's screen paint were still within the acceptable limit. While the Bear i300 had a much higher red gain than blue gain, resulting in all the white values being shifted towards red, and the low gain screens were generally less color accurate. But the paint on screen black screen was the most color accurate, and the Black Series Black Widow paint was the least color accurate. Interestingly though, while the Black Series Black Widow paint had a much higher blue gain and a lower red gain, it also seemed to reflect brighter light sources with a higher gain than dim ones, resulting in an increased 2250 to 1 contrast ratio compared to 1700 to 1 for most of the other screens, which is pretty surprising and not typically how screen gain works. So let's talk about why you would normally choose one screen gain over another. Selecting a screen gain lower than one can accomplish three different outcomes. The first is avoiding a raised black floor caused by a poorly light controlled room. And when I say light control, I'm not just talking about blocking the windows and turning off the lights, but also choosing dark paint for your walls and ceiling, using dark colored carpet and dark furniture. Otherwise, light from the projected image reflects off of surfaces in the room and then back onto the screen, resulting in a raised black floor and poor ANSI contrast even with extremely high end projectors like this JVC NZ8. Using a lower gain screen reduces the peak brightness of your image, making room reflections less of an issue, not only due to decreased initial reflections, but as that light bounces off the walls and back to the screen, it gets further reduced by the lower screen gain. The second reason that you might want a lower gain screen is if you have a projector with a lot of peak brightness but a poor black floor. The Dangbei Mars Pro 2, for instance, has a relatively high peak brightness of 178.9 nits on a 100 inch screen, but it has a pretty muddy black level of 0.216 nits. However, when paired with a 0.56 screen gain paint like the Crows Mix, the peak brightness would still be a respectable 100.18 nits, but the black floor would be reduced all the way down to 0.12 nits, which would appear much darker in a room with the lights off. And then the third possible reason for choosing a low gain screen applies more to these almost black screens like paints E through H that reduce even extremely bright projectors down to minuscule brightness values, but are also dark enough that the screen looks black even in a high ambient light environment. And using one of these screens with an extremely bright projector like this 6000 lumen Epson L1100U results in a more TV-like experience, though I don't think it's worth buying an $8,000 projector to produce an image that you could get from a $500 TV. And none of these paints can be classified as true ambient light rejecting or ceiling light rejecting screens since they don't have the physical lens structures that you'd find on a lenticular or a Fresnel screen designed for an ultra short throw projector. Speaking of which, screen finishes can perform very differently depending on your projector type. So I'll be testing each screen paint with long throw, short throw, and ultra short throw projectors, as well as single laser, triple laser, four LED, and single LED light sources, both with the lights on and the lights off. Starting with the most ideal combination possible, the $12,000 JVC NZ8 in full darkness with black curtains surrounding the viewing area. And you can see that even in these ideal conditions, room reflections spoil the almost perfect black floor of the JVC on screens A and B due to their high gain. And the surrounding blacks turn yellow as the light from the bright honey bounces around the room. Screens C, D, and E look much better. However, in scenes without large black areas, the extra brightness of screens A, B, C, and D make them more vibrant. For a projector with excellent black levels like the JVC, I thought screen C was the best balance between rejecting room reflections and preserving enough brightness to make the highlights pop. And even though screens D and F looked interesting, they had major hot spotting issues where the screen was significantly brighter directly in line with the projector's lens. And as a result, I picked screen E as the runner up with the lights off for viewing with the JVC. The next projector to test is the Dangbei Mars Pro 2, which like the JVC is a standard throw single laser projector, but unlike the JVC, the Dangbei has an extremely high black floor. So it will benefit more from a lower gain screen. And with the lights off, I still thought that screen C was the best and screen E was the runner up. But pausing on a black screen, you can really see how bad the hot spotting is on screens F and D, and there's even a little bit of hot spotting on screen A. Next, the last standard throw projector that we'll test is the Nexigo PJ40, which is a very inexpensive single LCD projector with a white LED light source and a much lower peak brightness. And despite its low lumen output, I still thought that screen C produced the best, most uniform image with good color 
color and low room reflections. But for this combination, screen B took second place because the Nexigo PJ40's lower brightness benefited from that higher screen gain. And while screen F admittedly looked eye-catching, there was still serious hot spotting. And you can see that the middle of the screen has similar brightness to screen A and B, while the outside of the screen looks darker than screen C and D. Moving on to the BenQ X500i, a short throw projector with a four LED light source, screens C and D both looked very good and there was less hot spotting with the short throw projector than there was with the Dangbei and JVC. Though you can still tell that the brightness of screen F is not at all consistent. And E also showed a little bit of hot spotting, while screens G and H had way too much brightness reduction. And I picked screen C as the best with this projector as well. And the last lights off test was with the Nexigo Aurora Pro, a triple laser ultra short throw projector with high brightness and a low black floor. And in this test, screens C and D were by far the best, but B and A were also good. I thought screens G and H were too dim and the steep projection angle of the ultra short throw projector helped to reduce the hot spotting on E and F, but the ceiling reflections were out of control and you could basically watch the video reflected off the ceiling above the projector. And also as a quick side note, I would generally just recommend against projecting onto a painted wall using an ultra short throw since the steep projection angle exaggerates any imperfections in the wall and the image will end up looking wavy no matter how perfect you think your wall is. And that means that for lights off viewing, screen C finished first for all five projectors, screen D came in second due to its middle of the road gain value but had issues with hot spotting, and screen B was in third struggling with room reflections but producing a more vibrant image during brighter scenes. So next we'll repeat all those same tests but with a bank of LED lights on at a 15 degree angle in front of the screens. Starting out with the JVC NZ8, Watching a $12,000 home theater specific projector with the lights on felt absolutely wrong. And basically all the advantages of buying an NZ8 are ruined by this amount of ambient light. However, screen E was the clear winner and had a low enough gain to be able to display blacks, but not so low that it couldn't show highlights. And I put screen G in second place and H in third, but if I'm being totally honest, the only one that I would consider watching for an extended period of time in these conditions was screen E. With the Dangbei Mars Pro 2, the little bit of extra brightness helped and screens G and H looked better, but I still preferred the image from screen E, and even though I gave screen F fourth place, the hot spotting from the projector, the streakiness of the paint, and the reflection of light off of its glossy surface was horrible and not something that I would ever seriously consider watching. But with the inexpensive Nexigo PJ40, the hot spotting near the center of the image on F was actually pretty eye-catching, and I wouldn't go as far to say that it was a good experience, but it was enough for me to put it in second place behind screen E. And unfortunately, the Nexigo PJ40 just doesn't have enough brightness to work with the ultra-low gain screens like G and H. The short throw BenQ X500i had less hot spotting on screen F, and if it weren't for the glossy reflections of the room lights, I probably would have picked it as first, but instead I put it in second with screen E in first again, followed by G and then H, which both had a more flat black look, but G was a little bit brighter in the highlights. And last, the ultra short throw Nexigo Aurora Pro looked horrible with the lights on on every single screen, especially compared to what you would see with a proper UST specific ambient light rejecting lenticular or Fresnel screen. But I guess if I had to pick the ones that were least bad, I'd probably choose screen C, then D, then E, then H, and G. But again, I really wouldn't recommend painting a wall to use with a UST projector, especially not for use with the lights on. And that means that for use in high ambient light, screen E came out on top for all the projectors except for the ultra short throw, and screen G was in second, and then H was in third. And then to recap issues that you might have with your specific projector type, screens D and F had big issues with hot spotting using a standard throw projector. With the short throw BenQ X500i, screen F was the only projector that had significant hot spotting. And while the ultra short throw Nexigo Aurora Pro produced the least hot spots, screens F and G were the worst offenders with the UST. I also tested for laser speckle problems using the JMGO N1 Ultra, which is an otherwise very high performing triple laser standard throw projector, except for the issue that it has with prevalent laser speckle. And I found that screens F and E had the worst and most noticeable speckle, while C and A mitigated speckle almost completely. All right, so it's conclusion time. Would I recommend any of these paints? Definitely. For lights off viewing, Paint C, which was the S1 ultimate contrast formulation from paint on screen, was by far the best, and I absolutely preferred it over my white fixed frame screen on all of my projectors across all content types when the lights were off. It was also the least expensive projector screen specific paint, it had the most even color gain throughout the entire brightness spectrum, it had no hot spotting, and it had good laser speckle mitigation. So if you're looking for a projector screen paint to use in a room with decent light control, the paint on screen S1 ultimate contrast formulation is the clear winner. However, if you're in a situation where you've got a little bit of ambient light creeping into your room and you still really want to use a projector, then I think Paint E, the Black Series Edition Imperial Gunmetal Black Widow, had the best overall picture with a smooth texture, no roller lines, and very little hot spotting despite a low overall gain. 
Unfortunately, it did have a much higher blue gain than red gain, leading to big white balance inaccuracies near peak brightness, so you might need to try to calibrate that away. And it also had very noticeable laser speckle when using triple laser projectors like the JMGO N1 Ultra and the Hisense C1. But for a bright single laser or RGB LED projector, I think it is a really good pick. And last, if your goal is to always watch your projector with the lights on, then I think you're much better off with a Fresnel ALR screen and an ultra short throw projector. But if you have a really bright projector like this 6000 lumen Epson Pro L1100U, then Paint H, the black projection surface from Paint on Screen, actually looked really good, even with the lights on. But it would really benefit from being sprayed rather than rolled because the matte texture made it really hard to paint without the roller lines showing. And even using that 6000 lumen Epson, the Fresnel screen and ultra short throw Nexago Aurora Pro looked much better when you turn the lights off. As always, there are no sponsored reviews on this channel and I don't have any affiliation with these projector screen paint companies or individuals, but I've got their various websites linked down in the description as well as Amazon links for all the projectors that I used in this video. And as always, I appreciate when you use those links since as an Amazon affiliate, I do earn a small commission on the sale at no cost to you. I also wanna thank all of my awesome patrons over at Patreon for your continued support on my channel. And if you're interested in supporting my channel, please check out the links down in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing. And as always, Thanks for watching The Hookup.